Hello, St. Mark's. It is so good to be with you today. Martin and Emily are two of our very closest friends and we've been thrilled to hear all that God is doing. And so it's a real honour to have this opportunity to share with you on the topic of worship. And I want to share a couple of thoughts from a passage in the scriptures in the book of Revelation, Revelation 1 verses 10 to 18. This is about the apostle John who's been exiled on the island of Patmos. So let's read together. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Theatria, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. I turned round to see a voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his hand, his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. The author, A.W. Tozer writes, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That is such a challenge. Our understanding, our view of God, of who he is, of his character, of his nature, of his power, his might, his love, defines and determines everything about how we will live our lives. And in this passage, we see a moment where John is in a desperate situation, but God brings great revelation, understanding, a bigger picture of who he is. This moment, John would have been in his mid 80s. He'd been exiled to this island of Patmos, basically to die. Legend has it that he'd been boiled in oil, beaten, tortured, broken. And he's now alone on this island, desperate. As much of the church that he's been leading and he's loved is being persecuted by the Roman Empire. Many of his friends, fellow disciples have been crucified and martyred. And alone, I imagine he's just bearing the weight of the world in physical anguish and pain, but emotionally devastated by all his friends, his family, the church that is being beaten, broken and bruised. He must have been in a desperate state, but we read that in this moment of dark despair, John continues his rhythms, his patterns of worship. On the Lord's day, on the day where the church would have gathered to worship, John continues that tradition, even though he's separated and alone, he continues to worship. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. There he was. Worshipping Jesus, thanking him, spending time in his presence. And what happens in that moment? You know, sometimes we can look into that situation, dark situations, challenging situations, think God just come and overturn the problem, get rid of the obstacles, make it all right. But God doesn't do that in that moment. John still remains in pain. The church continues to be persecuted. But what does God do? God brings a greater revelation of who he is to the Apostle John. First thing I want to say to you today is this. Worship is about revelation. Worship is about seeing afresh, understanding anew who God is. And the thing I want to encourage you with today is that in worship, there is always more. In worship, time in God's presence, time studying his word in prayer, gathering together corporately to worship, to sing. 
There is always more. It is never a waste of time because it's in those moments God begins to speak to us. God begins to open our eyes. God begins to transform uh, our hearts and we begin to understand, oh, this is who you are. I love it. The Apostle John, he spent three years on earth walking, talking, spending time with Jesus. He, He saw firsthand Jesus perform miracle after miracle, healing people, multiplying loaves and fishes to feed well over 5,000 people. He reclined at the chest of Jesus intimately as they broke bread together. He described himself, I'm the one who Jesus loves. He would have stood there watching Jesus being crucified. He'd have seen the resurrected Jesus. He'd have watched him ascend to the heaven. He had firsthand experience of being in the presence of Jesus Christ. And yet in this moment alone on the island of Patmos, John was to realise that there was even more. There was even more to see and understand. In this moment of pain and anguish, he gets a vision of the glorious, resurrected, eternal Jesus Christ that undoes him. Now you might be here and it's so easy for us to get casual, to get familiar. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time. You know, I get it. I know everything about Jesus. But you're missing out. There is more and I pray even today as you worship, as I continue to share, as the Spirit begins to move, that your eyes will be open. God would unrest your heart, kind of grab hold of you and shake you up to see a greater glimpse of Christ in his glory. Because this is the desperate need of the church. The desperate need of the church today is to understand more of who God is, to see Jesus in his glory. So John Suddenly his eyes are open and and he tries to describe what he's seen. I I love it as he tries to describe this vision of Jesus Christ. He, He can't adequately find the words. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And when I turned, I saw someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. This robe reminding John that Jesus is the priest, the mediator, the one who connects humanity to God. He's still in that role of connecting us to God, even seated at the right hand of the Father. The the golden sash around his chest, a symbol of victory. How amazing that John was sitting in the ruins of what felt like defeat and ruin and he sees Jesus and he's reminded, no, Jesus is victorious and we are his people. So therefore the church is victorious. He carries on. The the hair on his head was like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Jesus' eyes were like blazing fire, demonstrating this purity, this ability to cleanse, this holiness, something so intimate about staring into someone's eyes. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held the seven stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. You know, the seven stars at the time that people thought, scientists thought that there were seven planets. So this picture of in the right hand holding seven planets, this idea that Jesus holds the whole universe in the palm of his hands. And that gives you perspective, doesn't it, for John. My goodness, Jesus, you're the beginning, you're the end. In you all things hold together. You rule and you reign. You hold the whole world in the palm of your hands. Some of you maybe need to be reminded of that today with all that's going on in your life, all that we see going on in the world around us, the chaos, the confusion, the uncertainty. God holds the world in his hands. However desperate your situation might seem, might feel, God is in control. And then John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John, who'd spent three years in the presence of Jesus Christ whilst he was walking on earth, who knew him intimately when he saw the resurrected, ascended, glorious, victorious God. 
He was so overwhelmed. He was so shaken to the core. He was so undone that he fell at his feet as though dead. We need a bit more of that in our worship, in our lives. Breaking out of the familiar, shaken out of the normal, the ordinary, to understand, oh my goodness, woe is me. I long to see more in our worship as we're gathered, as we're singing, as we're spending time in God's presence, where suddenly people are on their knees before God. We've actually begun to see it a little bit here. People weeping in worship, people prostrate in worship, people dancing in worship, using all our bodies in worship because we understand something more of who God is that we cannot just sit there looking passive As if this is just a normal thing to be singing and thanking this God who died and rose again. No, no, this should shake us up. This should provoke wholehearted, abandoned, free worship. And this is the bit I love with the same right hand that's holding the seven stars. Jesus, the eternal one, reaches out and he touches John. He ruffles his hair, this beautiful picture of awe, fear, awesomeness, transcendence, but also intimacy, tenderness, closeness. The creator of the heavens and earth, perfect and holy, he was and is and is to come, reaches out to touch John. And he says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. This revelation so powerful for John. I imagine it changed the way he thought, the way he lived, the way he approached his last days on earth. And so I want to encourage you in your private devotional life, pray that God would open your eyes afresh Dare to believe that there is more for you. I believe as you gather and you spend time in worship, recognise it's in that place that God's going to be awakening wonder in you. God's going to be aligning your identity, reminding you of who you are before him, reminding you of who he is, his love for you, what he can do in and through you. Many of you are desperate for peace and you can find that in worship. Corrie ten Boom Spent many years in a concentration camp, experienced great pain, sorrow and loss. And she said this beautiful thing. She said, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. I mean, that is so true for us now, isn't it? If you look at yourself, you'll be depressed. Interesting to me that as the world caves in and becomes more and more inward looking and more and more insular that we're seeing, mental health, depression just increase because the answers are not within us. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look at yourself, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you'll be at rest. So many times in the Bible where the people of God in moments of pain and anguish chose to worship and it's in that place that God opened their eyes to see who he was. And that brought great comfort, great faith. And we're going to need great faith for the days ahead. So the first thing I want to say, that there's so much more to be discovered of Jesus, so much more for you to be encountered and grabbed hold of in that place of worship. Worship brings revelation. But the second and final thing I want to say to you is this. Worship is about transformation. Worship is to change. To see Jesus for who he is will always, if it's a genuine, true spirit-spirit encounter, it will change us. It has to change us, to see God in his glory. We can't stay the same. And it's as we begin to worship that I believe God is going to begin to move in great power. I love this story because John alone, the end of his days, worshipping Jesus, must have thought his best days were behind him. His best days of church planting, of carrying the gospel, of bringing God's kingdom to earth, they were behind him. But actually, oh my goodness, this revelation, this letter that was going to be written, these visions and musings and insights would be the very thing that would transform the church 
for thousands of years. I mean, we're here today, 2,000 plus years later, and we look at this book of Revelation, and yes, it's a bit crazy, and some of it we struggle to understand, but bottom line is we look at it and we see Jesus wins. Jesus is victorious. Great days are ahead for us. We understand something of what the worship of heaven looks like. Revelation 4 and 5, and it inspires us to remind ourselves that Jesus is at the center of the throne. We, we get to see that Jesus will return, a new heaven and a new earth where he'll right every wrong, where justice will come, where this world will be transformed. We, we look forward with hope to a day where there'll be no more tears, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more pain. This book, this revelation that John had on the island of Patmos has transformed everything for us. And so we can live boldly. We can have hope. We can keep going. We can persevere. We can be confident in sharing this message to all the world because we see that Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one who holds the keys. Jesus rules and he reigns. Jesus is returning. He's not left us or abandoned us. He's coming And he's working in us and through us presently to restore all things. In worship, there is transformation. There is change. There is breakthrough. There are miracles. There is healing. There's an invading of heaven and earth. And if you would choose to center your life on Jesus Christ as a church and a community to abandon yourselves into praise and worship, not just to waste your Sunday gatherings, just to go through the motions, sing a few songs, drink a nice cup of coffee, listen to Martin and Emily preach or share whatever is going on in the church, but say, no, Jesus, we're here to meet with you. And we believe you are doing doing extraordinary things in our days, in our time, in our midst. And we say yes to you. Come and have your way. Change us. Awaken us. Free us. I remember going to lead worship in a prison in Texas. It's a maximum secure prison. I'd never led worship in a prison before. And I was terrified, particularly in America. Because if you've seen all the shows, you know the American prisons are crazy. And uh, we wandered in. And I was beginning to think, well, how's this going to work? You know, we're in a place of evil. These men have committed the most heinous of crimes. Terror, rape, abuse, murder. They've destroyed lives. And how are we going to sing about the goodness of God? How are we going to talk about love? And how are they going to respond to Jesus? And I remember the guy who was doing our sound, chatting to him, and he was telling me that he was serving a 99-year prison sentence. Now, you don't ask someone what they've done to deserve 99 years of prison. And, you know, for that time, whatever he wanted for the sound was absolutely fine by me. I wasn't going to complain or ask for any more voice or whatever. And I remember 500 men walking into this gymnasium, all dressed in white. And we began to worship. And I remember the joy, the passion in the room was extraordinary. And I'll never forget singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound to save A wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And seeing these men with their hands raised high, one particular with a blonde mullet, tears streaming down his face. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And the sense of God's presence was so tangible and it surprised me. And it awakens something of my understanding of worship that actually in worship, when we understand who God is, we can be so transformed, so free that whatever our earthly circumstances and surroundings, they do not need to determine the rest of our lives. These men, many of them who'd never ever leave those cells, those walls, that prison, they were free. They were alive. There was joy. Of course, there must have been pain and challenge and annoying circumstances to have to keep staying in that prison. But there was a love and an understanding of what God had done for them that just transformed their lives. And don't you want that? Don't you want that? The the challenges you're surrounded by, the medical situation you're in, the financial pressures you're under, the broken relationships you're trying to navigate through, the abuse you've suffered from that still clings to you, the insecurity that still grabs hold of you. You can be free from it. And that freedom, it comes in worship. That's been my story time and time again in worship before Jesus. 
He begins to free me. He begins to loosen the grip of whether it's greed or selfishness or sin in my life or insecurity or not knowing what the future holds. He begins to bring peace and courage and faith and love. He speaks over me how he sees me, not how I see myself or how I assume the world sees me. And it begins to free me to live the life he's called me to lead. In worship, there is revelation to understand more of God, but in worship, there is transformation. Again, we've seen it time and time again here at Gastry. People coming into our church, coming into the worship, freedom, singing, celebrating. And I've lost count of the number of people have come up to me, say, with tears in their eyes, what was that? What was that? I've never felt emotion like that. I I just found myself weeping through the whole thing. What was it? They were experiencing the Spirit of God. They were getting a taste of heaven. Before we'd even told them about who Jesus is and what he can do for you, they were experiencing it in the context of worship. To worship is to understand that there is more, there's revelation, and to worship is to change. I really, really end with this. I was praying for you as a church and I remember having this picture this vision when I was watching Martin and Emily being installed as your new uh, vicars or whatever you call them Uh, and I just saw this wind blowing through your building and it displaced lots of things it was a um, beautiful awe-inspiring quite violent wind just came through the building unsettled things and I felt God say to me and you need to weigh this up and pray it through that God was coming in power the wind of his spirit was going to start blowing through your community and it would start displacing and unsettling things and things would move around and some of you you might if we're being really honest find that hard it's not what it used to look like or it's difficult and oh I don't quite like it like that but here's the deal if you will allow the Spirit of God to blow wherever he chooses, to do whatever he wants to do. There's going to be extraordinary blessing, extraordinary breakthrough. Things are going to begin to happen. Lives are going to begin to change. You're going to start seeing an influx of people coming to faith in your midst. There's going to be an outbreaking of signs and wonders. One of the things I know Martin and Emily uh, are called to do is to be people who minister and move in the power of the Spirit. That's always been on their lives since I've known them. And you're going to see them grow in that. But many others are going to begin to pray for people and they're going to get healed. There's going to be a release of the gift of the prophetic. Uh, You're going to see some wonderful things, but it will be unsettling. But this is why God is doing it, because there's a desperate need for his kingdom to come, his will to be done in Battersea, in London, as it is in heaven. So thank you for listening. I want to pray that God would bless you. There are exciting times ahead and I hope to look forward to visiting you in person at some point if I'm invited. Hint, hint. But let me pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you rule and you reign. We thank you that you're alive and you're working in our midst. Lord, a pandemic couldn't hold you back from moving in power. Lockdown couldn't stop you from working in power through your church. The things we see in our world which confuse us and break our hearts, they, they don't mean that you're not in control, that you're not moving. And we pray now that you'd open our eyes to understand afresh who you are. Bring great revelation, Lord, where we've got safe and predictable, where we've pursued comfort, awaken us, shock us back to life. Lord, I pray that you'd put a new song in our hearts, that we'd find ourselves dancing, whistling to work, singing in the shower, just full of gratitude for who you are. But Lord, also give us faith, faith to see what you're going to do, belief that you can do the unexpected. And Lord, I pray that the wind of the Spirit would blow through this church, this community right now. Pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. Amen.